Yes, I, I, I want to make this uh, w w one more point about Sweden joining NATO because this is, I think, a big deal, which um, uh, I don't think uh, I don't think is played enough is 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 discussed enough in the media and I, in and among strategic analysts. Russia is a country that has limited access to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it is a country with ambitions, with global ambitions. It's a country that has a large navy and has global ambitions with regard to that navy. And yet it has limited access to the Atlantic Ocean. We'll talk about the Pacific Ocean in a minute. Uh, it, it has basically two points of entry. One is through the Black Sea, and then it has to pass through um, uh, straits that are controlled 100% by Turkey, Turkey being a NATO member. That's right. Uh, and uh, then it has to go through the Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, having its entire northern shore controlled by NATO members, and then pass through the Straits of Gibraltar controlled by, to some extent at least, a NATO member, and only then go into the Atlantic Ocean. That's one. I guess there's a third path. The third, uh, so the second path, we'll get the, the second path is uh, in a season where the uh, Arctic Ocean is not frozen, it can come in from the north. It can come in from its northern uh, bases on the Arctic Ocean and come in from the north through the, through the northern Atlantic. But that's, that's difficult and in winter often impossible. Um, but um, the, one of the main ways in which it enters the Atlantic is through the Baltic Sea. So let's look at a map of the Baltic Sea. So here you see a map of the Baltic Sea. And you can see that Russia has two, um, two basic uh, entry points into the Baltic Sea. One from the St. Petersburg area uh, through the Gulf of Finland. It can travel, uh, its navy can travel into the Baltic Sea. And then uh, from the Baltic Sea uh, through the gap between uh, Denmark and, uh, and Sweden, it can travel into the Atlantic. The other place is Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad is a little island, not an island literally surrounded by sea, but a little island in the sense that it's not connected to the rest of Russia, but it is part of Russia, which sits between Poland and Lithuania. Poland and Lithuania, um, and uh, so it's completely isolated, and, and the Russians have a significant port there, and that port, uh, again, allows them access into the Baltic Sea and out into the North Sea, which is, you know, ultimately the path to the Atlantic Ocean. Notice what happens when Finland and Sweden join NATO. I mean, basically, the Baltic Sea becomes what some people are calling a NATO lake. I mean, the Russian fleet can be completely blocked uh, by the Swedes uh, uh, near Copenhagen there. It can be, you know, the, the Gulf of Finland can be completely controlled by Finland and Estonia, where you see Helsinki and uh, 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 Thailand on, uh, on the other side completely blocking it. I mean, basically, the, the, the Russians are completely isolated from the Atlantic Ocean uh, through the Baltic Sea and indeed completely isolated in the Baltic Sea itself a massive strategically important place for them. Now, you know, Sweden, the importance of Sweden joining, not only does Sweden uh, produce, uh, I've said this many times, produce military equipment, but Sweden has uh, a significant submarine fleet, which basically controls the Baltic Sea. Now Sweden is a part of NATO. In other words, NATO has a submarine fleet controlling the Baltic Sea. Norway controls the Norwegian Sea, which would be the access from the Arctic Circle. Turkey controls access to the Black Sea. Basically, if NATO wanted to, NATO could cut Russia off completely, with very little effort, from the Atlantic Ocean. And this is a major strategic issue. It's a major strategic advantage NATO has over Russia. And this kind of sets Russia back in terms of any kind of ambitions that they have to be a global power, any kind of ambitions that they have 
uh, to uh, exert influence uh, outside of Russia, particularly exert influence in Europe, but even to, to get to somewhere like Africa is not easy for them. Not easy for them. At least by sea. So uh, the, the, like, I've said this so many times, but it, it, it bears repeating. Finland and Sweden joining NATO is massive, massive. It is a, 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 a strategic defeat for Putin, a massive strategic defeat for Putin. Now, I want you to show you one other map, and this is a map. Whoops. Close that. I don't know what the hell that is. Okay. This is a map. I did not intend to do that. Sorry. This is a map of Russia. Um, uh, and, and you can see the, the scale of Russia. Russia is in a massive country. And you can see that uh, it has access, obviously, to the Arctic Ocean, but it, th that's a very difficult place to access and often uh, frozen over. And in order to get to the Atlantic, they would have to go along the Norwegian coast. So Norway has access to it. On the other side, they would have to go via Alaska, which is difficult. But, but really... The other access Russia has is to the Pacific, and, and it has a very extensive shoreline on the Pacific. But this is the challenge that the Russians have on the Pacific side. That area is mostly empty. Russia's population centers, industry centers are all in the West, not in the East. They're all Moscow, St. Petersburg, that kind of area, not way out in the eastern Russia, in, in, in Siberia. There's very little there. So yes, Russia has this lengthy Pacific coast. Not much they can do with it. In addition, you know, Russia's fought wars with Japan and uh, uh, lost. And the real power, when you look at the Pacific coast, is not Russia. The real power, if you look at Asia here, this part of northern and um, eastern Asia is not Russia, as much as the Russians would like to believe it is. But the real power here is China. And indeed, if you were in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan or any of the stands, and you have an historical alliance with Russia, an historical connection with Russia, because they occupied you when they were the USSR and maybe occupied you during the Russian Empire, now, when you look at Putin, when you look at Russia, when you look at their failure, when you look at NATO growing, when you look at everything else, who are you more likely to align with? A dying empire? A dying geopolitical force, Russia, which can offer you very little, or relatively, certainly relatively to, China, to Russia, a, a dynamic, thriving economy which wants to trade extensively with you even if you have to give up a little bit of sovereignty, which is China. Kazakhstan is much more likely to move in the direction of being under the influence of China than returning to the influence of Russia. Basically, what Putin has done in a very, very short period of time is he has weakened Russia so much he has, you know, basically killed any kind of Russian ambition in terms of any kind of uh, uh, geopolitical ambitions that the Russians might have. It's finished. It's, it's over. There is nothing. Right? China doesn't trust Putin. China has no interest in Putin. China's aligned with Russia only to the extent that it gets some cheap oil and cheap natural gas, only to the extent that it gets them that. China knows and believes that it's far superior to anything China has to offer. China believes it is the future. Russia is the distant past. The real force in Asia is China, maybe India. Russia is in decline. And it's always been in decline. It's been in decline since the fall of the USSR in terms of a projection of power. But what, Russia, what Putin has done is he's accelerated the, the, the visibility of that. He's accelerated our awareness of that. The world now knows. And you can see it, by the way, 
one of the elements of this is, is India. The India Modi is traveling around the world. He's just in France now, buying weapon systems from everybody except the Russians. Except the Russians. Um, all right. 